Welcome back everyone to Statistical Rethinking 2022. This is the fourth lecture in which I'll extend linear models to be able to capture more complex uh, scientific relationships and we'll talk a lot more about scientificals in this lecture than we did in the previous one. To give you a little bit of a reminder where we were last time, I'd introduced this idea of linear models as a uh, set of devices for constructing approximations of natural systems. So this is the uh, Ptolemaic model of the solar system animating on your screen in which uh, two circles are able to uh, reproduce the so-called retrograde or zigzag motion of Mars in the night sky. However, the model is not physically correct. The structure of uh, the orbits of Earth and the Mars looks nothing like this. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, a system like this can produce um, arbitrarily accurate approximations of the pass of the planets in the night sky. The same system uh, that is using circles on circles can construct any continuous path. So uh, here's what's called a complex uh, Fourier series and you can make a musical note because the outline is just a continuous path like an orbit and all of those circles on circles. Um, is it this weird little golem that uh, reconstructs this image uh, and if you have enough circles you can draw anything as long as it's a continuous path an orbit uh, as it were so musical notes uh, gears and so on linear models are similar in in the sense that by putting a bunch of straight lines together you can erect massive and complicated structures of arbitrary accuracy toward to some data set. Uh, now of course we have to be careful in, in how we do this uh, so that we're capturing the right structure and that we understand that we're merely building an approximation out of little building blocks, little straight line building blocks. Um, but this makes linear models incredibly powerful because uh, they can do lots of extra linear things or nonlinear things. And uh, in the lecture today I want to introduce you uh, to two of those things, that is the study of categories, that is discrete non-ordered types of things in the world. Linear models can handle that. Uh, the categories are often modeled with uh, devices called dummy variables or indicator variables um, and in this lecture I'm going to focus on another way of doing it called index variables. Uh, but they're all, they're all equivalent really. Uh, I'll explain why I prefer index variables. And then um, after the intermission, we're going to turn to making curves. Uh, and there are two ways I want to introduce to you to do that. The first is extremely common, uh, polynomials. It's common, but it has a huge number of drawbacks and, and probably should only be used in rare cases. And then there are splines, which are much more flexible uh, and can be extended to a bunch of related additive structures, uh, so-called uh, generalized additive models, which are very powerful. Okay, uh, this lecture is going to focus much more on statistical goals, or statistic, I mean, sorry, on scientific goals, uh, but there's lots of statistical machinery that we're going to need to get us there, and uh, we're going to be drawing the owl, but part of drawing the owl is uh, drawing the statistical model in a way that reflects our scientific goals, and as the uh, our analyses get more complicated, uh, you're going to see that we have to already start thinking about the statistical model and its relationship to our scientific estimates in a much more careful way. So we're going to incorporate causal thinking into how we draw the statistical models themselves and how we process the results. In order to do that in the example I'll use today we're going to have to talk about categories and um, this comes up all the time in data analysis. How do we cope with causes of phenomena that are not continuous? And uh, there are different kinds of non-continuous causes. Um, uh, we're going to talk about categories, by which I mean discrete unordered types, like the seashells on the right of this slide. Uh, there's no uh, gradation between the different types. They're real types. And if you count them, then you have counts of each type. And those are categories. Uh, Typically, not always, but typically what we want to do on the statistical side of analyzing categories is to stratify our analysis by the, each category. And that means, for example, in a linear regression, we fit a separate line for each category. Okay, a little bit about um, 
the attitude I encourage you to have towards uh, this lecture and the ones in the future. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in this material, as I keep saying, and at some point almost everybody feels a bit confused. And I just want to um, reassure you that your sense of confusion is merely a result of your attention. I'll say that again. Your sense of confusion is merely a result of your attention. Uh, there is no way uh, to pay attention to complex material and not feel confused. Uh, so you should be proud of your confusion and you will work your way out of it. Uh, you can back up, you can do things again. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture when I spoke about flow, you don't have to understand every piece of it in order to keep moving forward. Um, I think this, this confusion battle is a, a real significant one in learning statistical uh, machinery. Uh, I guarantee you that everybody uh, gets confused by this material. Um, I still get confused by it and that's why I, I keep very detailed notes about things I've done in the past. But we're in this together and we'll keep uh, swimming forward. We're going to come back to the um, Howell uh, height and weight data and we're going to introduce um, uh, two more variables in this lecture. We're only going to focus on, on, on one of them for now. Uh, that is the sex of the individual, whether they're male or female. If you look in the HAL data, we're, we're still only focusing on adults for now, individuals 18 or older. Um, you'll see that there's a column for age and there's a column of, of 0, 1 indicator variable indicating whether the individual is male. And on the right I've plotted the relationships uh, among height, weight, and then I've used color uh, for the individual's um, uh, uh, gender whether they're a woman or a man. Now, what I want us to do is model the relationship among these three variables, or rather model the influences of, of height and sex on weight in adults in this population in the Kalahari. Um, so in order to do something sensible statistically here, we're gonna have to think scientifically first. Uh, there's a distinction to be drawn here between how height, weight, and sex are causally related to one another and how they're statistically related to one another. So of course they're, they're all associated. Height, weight, and sex are statistically associated in, in quite strong ways in every human population. Um, but their causal relationships are not obvious from those associations and so we have to think a bit. And we're, what we're going to do is build up the heuristic causal model on the bottom of this slide. This is a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. The, I introduced this device in the first lecture of the course. But we're going to build it up in pieces. So hang on. Uh, so the causes uh, of these variables aren't in the data themselves. Uh, they're reflected in the data, of course. The data reflect the causal relationships among them. But you can't simply read the causal um, the causal effects off the data. Let me give you a few examples and this will let us walk forward and build up a little a little toy causal model of these variables. Consider just the relationship between height and weight which we focused on in the previous lecture. Um, the data plotted on the right are equally compatible with height influencing weight and with weight influencing height and I've drawn the two DAGs to represent that on the left of this slide. An arrow going from H to W means that height influences weight, and an arrow going from W to H means that weight influences height. Both of those causal models will, can produce the same data as you see it on this slide. Uh, but of course we have some science, we know something about human biology, and it's reasonable uh, to pick the top one here, that height influences weight. Why? Because if you think about an intervention on height, uh, it'll change, if you change an individual's uh, adult height, you end up changing their weight. Why? Because there's less of them, so they have less mass. Uh, in the reverse, you can change an individual's weight without changing their height. There are lots of ways to change an individual's weight without changing their height. Um, and so we, uh, one way to think about this is biologically, given the way humans grow, um, height influences weight, because as you make a person taller, there's more of them. Let's think uh, similarly about the relationship between height and uh, uh, sex, a person's birth sex. So uh, again, we, I plotted uh, the data on the right of this. These are the uh, kernel density estimates uh, from the sample of the heights of women and men. I, I plotted women in red and men in blue. And unsurprisingly, like uh, all human populations, men are a little bit um, taller on average than women in the same in the same local population. 
these data are equally compatible with the idea that height influences sex and that uh, sex influences height. But you'll find the first one a bit silly because you have a lot of uh, scientific knowledge about your own uh, the, the, the human animal and you know that uh, it doesn't make any sense to say that uh, uh, adult height influences a person's birth sex. Uh, the causality is completely wacky uh, but it makes plenty of sense to say that someone's birth sex influences their height. Similarly um, uh, we have the same uh, little paradox if you will uh, with weight. Uh, there are there's a small mean difference in adult weight between men and women in the same local population and we find that again in this sample and again these data are compatible with both DAGs in the lower left of this slide. Uh, but again, some scientific background information um, leads us to assert that uh, birth sex is, if there's any influence of one of these variables on the other, it's, it's birth sex influencing height and weight and not the reverse. So let's put all these pieces together then uh, uh, in, so that there's a, a DAG, a heuristic causal model that includes all three variables. And you can read the nodes of these as um, statements about what is influencing each variable. So for height, uh, height influences weight, and weight is in, uh, and for sex, sex influences both height and weight, and weight is influenced by both height and sex. And those are the relationships that are indicated by the arrows in this diagram. Of course, to, to do more work, we have to specify exactly how those influences work, the shape of the functions. Uh, but you can do a lot with this heuristic representation. Right, so when you when you pick functions, you can say like what's the uh, uh, what's the mathematical content of a heuristic causal model like this? It's just what's on the right of this slide, some anonymous set of functions that h is equal to is determined by some function for height to determine height uh, that is a function of sex. And then for weight, similarly, weight is equal to some function for weight uh, of height and sex. And when we build statistical models or uh, fully detailed um, generative causal models, we have to we have to fill in these functions so they're no longer anonymous. But let's still let's think conceptually just for a second about the consequence of an innocent little graph like this. I'm going to start animating this thing, and what's going to happen is along the causal path, following the arrows. Um, the effects of each variable are going to flow. Uh, and what I want you to see is that, uh, that the consequence of this is that causal effects are transmitted down the line. That is, they don't just stop when they hit a, hit a variable. They can keep moving on to further variables along what's going to be called a path. That is, uh, some connecting set of arrows. Um, so uh, blue is going to represent sex, and uh, red is going to represent height. I'm going to start the animation now. You can see sex influences height and weight. Uh, so weight gets a direct influence from sex, and uh, this is accumulating up there in the upper right above it. Um, but the, the blue that hits height, if you will, uh, you can say it, it contaminates height in a sense. So there's a, there's a causal force uh, of sex that goes works through height. Even though height has a direct effect on weight, right, because you make an individual taller or shorter, you change their weight. Um, if sex has a, a significant um, causal impact on height, then uh, part of the total causal effect of sex works through height. And this is already uh, a sort of thing that we need to think carefully about when we do statistical inference. So let's distinguish uh, a set of different questions, scientific causal questions. Um, and each of them implies some different manipulation with this heuristic causal model. It's now no longer the case that we just have one extremely simple causal model and one almost identical statistical model like in the previous lecture. Now we're going to have to make distinctions. So different causal questions often require different statistical models. So a first question we might have, for example, is what's the causal effect of height on weight? <coughs> Remember, a causal effect in statistics is not um, uh, some mystical, uh, philosophical sort of thing. It merely means that you're able to predict the consequence of intervening on a variable. So the causal effect of height on weight means uh, what is the effect of intervening on height on weight? That is, when we change an individual's height, uh, what is the uh, distribution of effects on weight? <coughs> 
And so this question is, is addressed by the top part uh, that I've highlighted in red of the DAG on the right. Uh, another causal question we might have is what's the causal effect of sex on weight? Uh, now this involves the whole graph. Um, so I've highlighted the variables that are relevant and I've left height black because it's not relevant to this query. And, and uh, that, that'll sound a little bit confusing right now if you're new to this sort of thing and that's fine. Um, I'm going to layer in the explanation for why. Uh, uh, but the key intuition was from the animated uh, DAG a couple slides back. Uh, remember that part of the causal effect of sex operates through the height path. So we want to consider all the ways that sex influences weight to get the causal effect of sex on weight. That is to answer the question, uh, what would be the consequence of changing someone's birth sex? Uh, you've got to account for all the pathways by which birth sex influences adult weight. Finally, uh, there's the direct causal effect of sex on weight. Uh, what is, is there a direct causal effect of sex on weight and how can we estimate it? In this case, it turns out uh, we need to include height in the analysis to do this now. Um, and uh, the reason is because we're going to use height in a sense to block uh, the indirect causal effect. And again, it, if you're new to this, that's going to be confusing. I'm going to layer in the understanding of it as we go. Uh, but we have to consider, uh, uh, explicitly consider uh, the mediation effect, as it's called, of height on weight in order to isolate any direct effect uh, of sex on weight. Okay, let's consider just two of these, though, for the sake of this lecture. Uh, and these are our uh, theoretical estimands, and we're going to turn them into estimates. Uh, so the first question on the left of this slide, what's the causal effect of sex on weight? This is the total causal effect of sex on weight. Um, and then the uh, question on the right, what is the direct ca causal effect of sex on weight? How can we isolate that? And to answer these questions statistically, we're going to have to model sex as a categorical variable. So this will give us a good excuse to teach you how to do, um, how to work with categorical variables. So let's draw the owl, drawing categorical owls here. There are several ways to do this in statistics, and all of them are uh, technically equivalent, although in practice, of course, things that are technically equivalent are often not equivalent in practice. Um, the, probably the most common way to do this that you've seen before is the use of things called dummy or indicator variables. These are a series of zero, one variables that basically stand in for each category. So if you have 10 categories, typically you'll end up with nine of these dummy or indicator variables. And um, this works fine, but it's, it's a big bookkeeping nightmare in my opinion. Uh, what I prefer to use are called index variables. Again, they're equivalent, but in code, it's much easier to use these. Index variables will, will have a detailed example in the next slides. Um, assign an index value to each of the d unique categories. So if you have four categories, you'll use the index values one, two, three, and four. Uh, but regardless of how many you have, you have an infinite number of integers, so you can do it with an index variable. We're going to use index variables uh, because actually if the number of categories change, you can use the same statistical modeling code. And nothing really changes if you use index variables. Whereas for dummy and indicator variables, you have to change the whole model to add the new, cat the new dummy variables. Um, it, it's also nearly always easier to specify sensible scientific priors if you use index variables than if you use dummy variables. Um, and I say some more about that in the book. Uh, and when we get to multi-level modeling in the second half of the course, those uh, always use index variables. And so if you learn index variables now, you're not going to have to deal with that new concept when you get to multi-level models. Let me give you a toy example before we come back to the real data set. So suppose our categories are um, uh, these colors. Uh, these are typical printer ink colors, right? Cyan, magenta, yellow, black. And that gives us four categories. And what we do, we, we create a, a variable in our data set, an index variable, that really replaces each of these names, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, with a unique integer, one, two, three, and four. There's no order implied by the 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're just numerical uh, substitutes. And their function, actually, is that they're index positions in a vector, uh, which is just a kind of list of parameters. And so now we're going to have a vector alpha uh, of parameters, which we'll estimate. And this vector will uh, estimate the influence of color 
but it, inside this vector there are really four unique parameters named alpha sub 1, alpha sub 2, alpha sub 3, and alpha sub 4. And what the index values do is they give us a, a very elegant way in the code to pull out the right parameter for each case in the data set. And I'll show you how this works. Um, so again, uh, repeating the alpha vector at the top here, alpha sub 1 is the parameter for cyan, uh, alpha sub 2 for magenta, alpha sub 3 for yellow, and alpha sub 4 for black. And then say we had a, a linear regression, there's some outcome like uh, uh, how much a person likes a color. And uh, in the linear model for this, we simply um, put alpha, and then I've subscripted it with color. Color is the name of our uh, index variable, and then bracket i. And that means for the ith case in the data set, you find the color index value and say it's 1, and then it'll pull out the first element of the alpha vector. I'm going to walk you through this in a, in a detailed way when we get to the real data set. So if it's, this isn't totally clear right now, you'll get, you'll get another chance or two. Okay, let's do it for the, the weight data now. So we're going to build a, a model uh, of, of weight um, as it is influenced by a person's sex. And um, uh, if we're going to just estimate average weight, it would be the model on the screen here. It's just a uh, weight has some normal distribution, and its mean is a parameter alpha, and that's often called an intercept. In this case, there's no slope, but uh, we would often, often still call alpha an intercept. What we do when we make an, uh, analyze by a categorical variable is we construct a vector of these alphas, and we subscript them by uh, the categorical variable of interest. So what I've done on the, on the left of this slide is I've constructed a variable s for sex, which is an index variable. There are two sexes, 1 and 2. s equals 1 indicates female, s equals 2 indicates male. And uh, so s sub i or s bracket i, I used a bracket because if you, if you made the i a subscript on this slide, uh, it would be really tiny, right? I think you can uh, imagine what that would look like. Um, so S bracket I tells you the sex of the ith person in the data set. And then that lets us extract the correct alpha parameter for the ith case. Let me animate this a little bit to give you an idea of what's going on. So consider I equals 1. That's the first individual in the data set. Their S value is 2, which means uh, male. And so S bracket I has the value, um, that's S bracket 1 is equals 2. You can see that uh, up on the left. And that means that that code becomes alpha sub 2. And that's the parameter that gets inserted in the model. And that'll be, and that parameter then will functionally estimate the mean weight uh, for males in the data set. Likewise, second, we can move to the second individual, i equals 2 now, and s2 equals 1. That is, uh, s, the value of s on the second row in the data set equals 1, and that pulls out alpha 1 correspondingly. You also need some priors for this. Uh, in the code, the assigning priors here doesn't really look any different. Uh, in, in mathematical notation, you'll put a little sub j or some other index next to the alpha j to indicate that there's a series of them. There's more than one alpha parameter. But you can assign each of them the same prior, which would correspond to the idea that uh, prior to seeing the data, you have the same prior expectation of the distribution of each of these. That you don't have to do that. Uh, but this is a very neutral way to, to uh, approach estimating differences in categories. Okay, in code. Um, uh, the QAP tool in the rethinking package makes this uh, quite easy for you uh, because it'll automate the con um, uh, all this lookup and stuff. You do have to construct the index variable though. So on this slide, that's what I'm showing you. The top part of the code box here on the left um, uh, you'll see that in the dat list, the variable s is constructed by just taking the, the male variable in the data set and adding 1 to it. And that gives us an index variable where 1 equal, means female and 2 means male. And then the quap model, all you have to do is bracket um, the relevant parameter with the s variable. And then uh, it does the rest. It uh, quap counts how many unique categories there are, and it makes uh, a a vector of the right length but otherwise the code is same. 
This is one of the reasons, for example, that if, if uh, the number of categories changes, the code would stay the same. You would just change the contents of the S variable in this code, and Quap will figure out the rest. Okay, so you run that model. Um, you get the uh, uh, quadratic approximate posterior distribution, joint posterior distribution for all of the parameters. Then you need to do something with that. So let's spend a little time processing and understanding what we've just gotten out of here. Remember what we're after is the total causal effect of uh, an individual's birth sex on their adult weight. So uh, the first thing we might do is look at the, the posterior mean weight uh, implied by this model. And in this code, I've extracted um, samples from the posterior distribution and then we're going to use those uh, to plot up the densities here and so all I've done is I've plotted uh, the, the posterior density for alpha sub 1 uh, that means the um, posterior mean weight uh, for uh, women in the sample and then the pos and then the posterior density for alpha sub 2 which is the posterior mean weight uh, for men in the sample. These are the means. These are not the, the observed distributions of individuals' weights. We're going to do that next. These are just the posterior means and uh, plotted in the upper right of this slide. Unsurprisingly, um, the men are, are reliably heavier on average, but men are not reliably heavier. I'll show you that next. <laughs> they're reliably heavier on average, but they're not reliably heavier. Um, Next, we do the actual distributions, and to do this, we need to simulate observations. So now, we uh, uh, W1 here is um, a, a posterior predicted distribution of adult weights for sex one, that is, women in the sample. And you'll see in that simulation, it just uses R norm. We've done this before. I simulate a thousand women, and uh, in the mean, I insert alpha sub one, uh, and then we have sigma in there to give us the scatter uh, around the mean. Uh, same sort of code uh, for the men, but with alpha sub 2 instead. Um, and then I just draw the densities. And now you see there's a lot of overlap. And of course, all you know this, in any local population, men are on average taller than women. But there are lots of women who are taller than men and lots of men who are shorter than women. There's a lot of overlap in these distributions. So what do we make of this overlap? Um, if you want uh, to think about uh, differences between categories, what you need to do is compute what's called a contrast, right? And so I say always be contrasting. You can't interpret the overlap of distributions because parameters are correlated with one another. If there's uncertainty in a parameter, that uncertainty uh, may be highly correlated with uncertainty in some other parameter, or say, I should say associated, because correlation is a very um, limited uh, concept of association because it's linear. Uh, so what you really need to do, the proper thing to do, and this is true of all uh, statistical frameworks, this is not a Bayesian thing, not only a Bayesian thing, is you compute something called the contrast, which is the distribution of the difference between the categories. Right? It's, it's never legitimate to simply compare the overlap uh, in the parameters. And so for example, for the, the distributions plotted on the right of this slide, what we'd like to know is what's the distribution of the difference in, in predicted weight um, between men and women in this population. Right? And we can't get that from just uh, plotting these densities over one another. Right? We, have to, we have to pull it up. And this will get us at our theoretical estimate, what would be the um, counterfactual uh, causal effect of changing someone's uh, sex at birth on their um, predicted weight, posterior predicted weight. Would they be heavier or would they be uh, lighter? And um, there'll be a distribution of effects and that's what we want to get because that distribution of effects is the, is the theoretical estimate we're after. So we're gonna, let's compute that contrast distribution, see what it looks like. Oh, here's an extended example to, to bring it home why you don't compare overlap. So I, on the left of this slide, I've just made up two parameters. These, this has nothing to do with the, um, only conceptually related to the analysis we're doing. But these are just simulated numbers. I've simulated uh, uh, two numbers which have a, a strong positive correlation. You can see that. Now, I've plotted up densities, different densities for these two variables. I plotted parameter 1 in blue and parameter 2 in red. You notice parameter 2 tends to be a little bit smaller than parameter 1. Uh, and they overlap a lot in their values. Uh, 
Um, however, since they're so strongly positively correlated, when you compute the difference between parameter 1 and parameter 2 for any point, on, uh, uh, for all the points rather, we take all the points on the left of this slide and we compute the difference between parameter 1, that is the x-axis value, and parameter 2, the, the y-axis value, and then I plot the distribution of that difference in black on the right. And you'll see that this is very narrow. It, it clusters around minus 1 nearly always, and that's because there's a strong positive correlation here. So the overlap, the apparent visual overlap between parameter 1 and parameter 2 is not a good guide um, to their difference. So if you want to know the difference between two, two distributions, you've got to compute the difference. You can't just use overlap. This extends uh, conceptually to a bunch of other bad habits uh, that people do. You, you, you can't directly compare confidence intervals to one another. If, if there's two different estimates and you want to understand their difference, you have to compute that difference and look at the confidence interval of that difference. I'll say that again. If there are two parameters of interest, you can't compare their confidence intervals to decide how different they are. You have to compute their difference and then look at the confidence interval of that difference. And This goes for p-values as well. You never, never compare p-values to one another. You need to construct the difference between the things of interest, and then, and then if you want a p-value, get the p-value on that. Okay, so how do we compute such a contrast? Um, at the top output box on this slide on the left, I'm just showing you I've extracted the samples from the posterior distribution. It's in the object post, which is the convention I use in the book and in, in the whole class. And then if you look at the structure of this, you'll see we've got um, two uh, parameters in the posterior distribution. There's sigma, which is the standard deviation around adult weights. Um, and we've got 10,000 samples of that. And then there's the alphas. And alpha is a matrix. It has 10,000 rows, because there's a sample in each row, and two columns, because there's a column for each sex, for each category. And so when we extract these things, we're going to use our little bracket notation to get the column of interest uh, for each calculation. So now in the calculation on the bottom left, I'm computing uh, the contrast in mu, where mu is the um, average adult weight uh, between the sexes by, by taking alpha 2, alpha sub 2, out uh, using the a bracket comma 2 notation, right? So the, the putting nothing before the comma means all of the samples. Uh, those of you who use R, you're, you're familiar with this. I, um, if you're not so used to R, let me say it again. Uh, this notation, A bracket, comma, 2 bracket, what that does is it gives you all the samples. That is, all the rows. That's why there's no number before the comma. That implies all of them, but only the second column. So you get all the samples uh, for uh, the male, all the, for the male alpha, for alpha sub 2. And then we subtract um, alpha sub 1, all the samples for alpha sub 1 from that. But since uh, the, it uses corresponding samples as it does this difference, the correlation between these two things is preserved. and that, So this is the only correct way to do it. And then we plot that contrast, and that's what I'm showing you um, at the bottom here. Uh, this is the, the theoretical estimate here, the posterior mean weight contrast um, between men and women in this particular Kalahari population is a little below 7 on average, but um, there's uncertainty about it. It ranges between 5 and, and almost 9. That's kilograms, by the way. I should have said it's kilograms. Um, we can also do the contrast on the full distribution. And there's a little bit more value in this, too, because you get to think about this overlap again and uh, uh, consider um, uh, how often uh, the co uh, theoretical causal intervention of changing someone's birth sex uh, would not make them taller, right? Because there's lots of other stuff that happens uh, that affects a person's, I mean, not taller, heavier, because there's lots of other stuff that affects a person's body weight. And to do this, uh, as you intuit, we uh, simulate uh, weight distributions and then we uh, subtract one from the other. So now we compute the contrast, the weight contrast, we subtract um, uh, a set of a thousand um, uh, adult male weights from, uh, or sorry, adult female weights from adult male weights, and then we plot that distribution. And I've plotted this in the lower right uh, of this slide, and I've colored it so that you can see that 82% um, of the area under this curve, is, which is colored in blue, is a case where uh, the, the males are taller. Uh, but in 18% of the cases, the, the women are taller uh, in the simulation. Right, so this is a consequence of the significant overlap in the distributions.
Okay. Where are we at? So we had our two S demands, and uh, we've filled in one of them so far, the causal effect of uh, burst sex uh, on weight. Uh, we have it in, in the form of these, um, these two distributions, these two contrast distributions that we've gotten. And these, these measure the causal effect of, of burst sex on weight through both paths that we have in the deck. Right? And the height, which is in black here, was not even in the model. We haven't even used it yet. Uh, but we've been able to estimate the total effect of sex, uh, burst sex on weight. Now let's worry about the direct effect and see what we have to do. Uh, we have to add height to the model. And we're still going to use index variables, and now what we're going to do is we're going to take our equation for a line, and that's what I have up on the slide here. This is just a linear regression of weight on height. This was introduced to you in the previous lecture. Um, and uh, focus your eyes on the intercept and the slope because what we're going to do is we're going to subscript both of those by sex now. Uh, so you can see uh, just same structure as, as the previous introduction of this. We use the same index variable, uh, but now we have uh, two vectors of parameters. We have a, uh, an alpha vector with two elements and a beta vector with two elements. So each sex gets its own intercept and its own slope. We're, this is, uh, as I said before, this is stratifying by sex. So uh, we get a different regression relationship estimate uh, for each sex. Uh, yeah, and the uh, all the lookup work, works the same way, except now um, what the uh, linear model is doing is it's simultaneously looking up the proper alpha value and the proper beta value. And you'll always get alpha 2 when you get uh, beta 2, and you'll always get alpha 1 when you get beta 1 because of the way the vectors are set up. The code, uh, not very different. Uh, the data setup is all the same as before. And now you'll see that um, uh, the slope and height is back in the model. And again, we just put brackets next to the slope, uh, both in the declaration of the prior and in the equation for the mean for mu. OK, uh, after you've got the uh, joint posterior distribution for all these parameters, uh, there's stuff we'd like to do, right? Uh, we want to compute the posterior predictive uh, for women. Uh, we want to compute the posterior predictive for men. And then we're going to subtract number two from number one, and this will give us the contrast between these two, right? So you can probably see intuitively from the, the plot on the right, uh, I plotted some lines. Those are the posterior mean regression lines for women in red and for men in blue. And you, you can probably see they're not very different. Uh, but again, you don't just visually eyeball the lines to talk about their difference. Let's compute their difference. So what we're going to do is at every height value on the horizontal axis, we're going to compute the difference in the posterior uh, distributions uh, of those expectations. And not just the lines on there, but including all the posterior uncertainty about the exact positions of the lines. And then we're going to plot that distribution. And that'll give us an idea, having stratified um, by sex, uh, is there any direct effect still of sex on weight uh, that doesn't, after we've accounted for the effect on height? And that means looking at each height value and saying, are the sexes different? I'll say that again. That means at each height value, are the sexes still different in weight? And, and again, you can look at those lines and you know the answer, but we've got to get there in a, in a justified uh, way statistically. So there's a lot of uh, code on this slide, and um, but it's not that complicated. Let me let me talk you through it a bit from top to bottom. Uh, the first thing we do on this slide is I just set up a sequence of x values. Those are height values. Uh, and for each of these, we're going to compute um, uh, the difference between uh, the difference between the posterior predicted adult weight of women and men in this population. So that's what we do. Uh, those mu f is going to be the uh, posterior mean predicted weights of uh, females in the population. And I just use the link function from the rethinking package to do this. Um, I pass in the x sequence. And I assign s to be uh, it's just uh, 50 women because there are 50 height values. And, um, and then I, uh, we can plot that. Um, and then there is mu. Uh, we do the mu m for males, same code, but now we replace s. Uh, s is 52, uh, 50 values of 2, because we're using the second uh, index value in each of these, in each of the parameter vectors. 
and then uh, we compute mu contrast exactly as as you'd expect by subtracting the male distribution from the female distribution and then I plot it and the plotting code at the bottom of this box produces the output on the right here and what you're looking at is horizontal axis is height and those are all the height values we're stratifying by and then the vertical axis is the posterior distribution of the weight contrast between women and men and uh, so on above the dashed line which is at zero women are heavier and um, below the dashed line men are heavier and you can see that there's a there's a slight tilt to this um, there's not much difference but there's a slight tilt in the sense that shorter individuals the the men tend to be heavier or another way to say this is for a woman and man of the same height if they're if they're short then the man will tend to be heavier but as you can see it's not a very reliable uh, relationship and for taller individuals for for tall men and women of the same height uh, the woman tends to be heavier <coughs> excuse me so uh, what does this tell us? Uh, nearly all of the causal effect of birth sex in this data set acts through height because there's a very substantial and reliable adult weight difference between men and women in this population and men are taller, uh, reliably taller, although there's lots of overlap uh, uh, than women in this population. Uh, after we've stratified by height, we find that there's very little difference left. But there's something going on here. This Just because the distribution overlaps zero, that's there's no uh, scientifically justifiable reason to simply ignore uh, uh, what's going on here. Okay, let's update our uh, estimand estimate slide. Now on the right I've put that graph that we just produced and this is uh, an estimate of the direct causal effect of sex on weight and it's modest unreliable but there's a little bit of something going on there probably. Okay, before uh, we get to the end of this section and we take our intermission I want to talk about an equivalent and alternative way to do the analysis we just did. So the way we just uh, proceeded, we used two statistical models, one for each of our theoretical estimates. We wanted to know the total causal effect of birth sex and we wanted to know the direct causal effect of birth sex. And we had one causal model, one DAG, but two statistical models. And that's a very common way to proceed uh, and, and it's, it's perfectly legitimate. I, I do it all the time. But there's an alternative and completely equivalent approach where you use one statistical model that represents the entire causal system, all of its pieces. Uh, and then you use the joint posterior distribution from that joint causal model to compute each estimate. So you end up doing the same amount of work. There's one statistical model, but then at the end you have to uh, compute, or rather, as I'll show you, simulate each estimate separately. So uh, you've got a choice here, and I'll summarize this at the end. Um, uh, uh, but I'll say it now as well, you can proceed either by stating each estimate and then having a statistical model for each, or you can fit one global statistical model for the whole causal system, but then you have to simulate each estimate separately uh, from the output. Let me walk you through this so you get an idea how this works. So here is the way you'd specify the whole causal system in QAP. Uh, and what I want you to see is you're just running the model for weight and the model for height simultaneously. And, and this is perfectly fine. It's two linear regressions, uh, but they're run simultaneously and all of their parameters are going to be present in the same posterior distribution. So uh, let, let's go a little bit slow uh, through here. What you can, I've used some color on the right hand part of this slide to show you that there are some submodels in the DAG. So the, the red causal arrows pointing into weight imply the the statistical model for weight and uh, I've, I've specified that as a linear regression of weight on um, the interaction between height and sex. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with interactions don't worry we're gonna we're gonna have a whole lecture about them later. Um, and then uh, uh, the blue arrow is the simple linear regression of sex on height where we, we uh, stratify height by sex. And we haven't done this model before, but I think you can probably guess from its structure what's going on. I've just invented a vector of parameters, little h, um, and there's one for each sex, and we estimate those separately. If you run this model, you get a really big posterior distribution. I'm showing you the Precy output at the top of this slide. Um, you get two alphas, two h's, and two betas, um, and, and a sigma, and also a tau. What is tau? That's the standard deviation around height. And um, you, again, 
don't be tempted to eyeball uh, this pricey output and interpret differences. You've got to compute the contrast between the first and the second elements in these things or between the first and second mu's in the cases of the lines to understand what's going on. Um, so let me remind you we're after causal effects. Causal effect is a consequence of an intervention in statistics. It's, it has no more philosophical depth than that usually. Now what we must do is simulate each of these interventions and you know the model so you can simulate from it. Uh, so let's do it in the really you know draw the owl with all the steps version uh, and then on the next slide I'll show you how to automate this. Okay so starting from the top of the code box on this slide the first thing we do is we extract samples from the posterior distribution and then I just set up a, a hbar uh, the mean value of height in the population in a convenience variable because I'm going to use it in the calculations below. Uh, then I set n to be the number of simula simulated people I want to do for each variable. And here this is 10,001E4. Now there's this big uh, block of code that starts with the word with. And uh, with in R is a way of creating um, scope. So I say with post, with the posterior distribution, do all this stuff uh, in, in braces. And what that means is I don't have to put that uh, dollar sign value after post to access the elements of it. I can just use the parameter names uh, nakedly, as it were, in the code, and it'll find them in post. And this makes code much cleaner and easier to debug. And so I recommend doing this uh, using uh, with the with constructor to create some what's called local scope here. So um, the first block there uh, commented with the name simulate w for s equals 1. We're going to simulate 10,000 uh, uh, women, adult women, uh, but we have to simulate them in order because we're imagining an intervention on sex. So we're going to uh, first calculate, uh, do simulations for women, and then we're going to do calculations uh, for men where the only difference is, is uh, sex at birth. So, uh, but uh, we know the graph and we have to follow up on all the paths. So the first thing we have to do is simulate height. Why? Because weight is a function of both sex and height. So we need to simulate height first. So we simulate uh, height, just 10,000 heights um, for counterfactual uh, women, S equals one, using our norm. So we access uh, the first column of the H vector in the posterior. And then we simulate their weights using their simulated heights. And that's the W underscore S1 line. Then we simulate, um, do the same simulation, but now for S equals two, this is the intervention. Uh, the code, the only thing, only difference in the code is the ones have been replaced by twos. And then we could simply compute the contrast at the bottom. And I called this contrast W do S because uh, uh, in this causal inference literature, there's this thing called the do operator, which is the um, uh, intervention operator, which means the, the W do S should hold the distribution of effects that result from intervening on birth sex. And so uh, on the right, we can plot this distribution. Uh, it's written here as PW conditional on do S. That is the consequence of changing sex at birth. Um, and uh, we get the same distributions we got before. These are, are I've replotted them, but these are the same graphs, that, the same densities that we got the other way. I told you these were equivalent uh, approaches. Uh, it's just in one of them, you do the work up front. You have to build multiple statistical models, and then you get your separate estimates. Um, in this approach, uh, you, you do less work up front because you make one statistical model, although it's, it's bigger. Uh, and, but then you have to run simulations uh, at the end to get things out of it. Um, there's an automated way to do this in the rethinking package. The sim function will take a quap model and uh, you give it a data list of the variables that you want interventions on and, and the values that the interventions will, will cover. So here S is a, is a vector holding the values one and two. And then you use the vars argument to say which variables should be simulated from the causal structure uh, implied in the model. And then you can get uh, a W do S uh, auto uh, computed the automatic way by doing the difference between these two things. Uh, and you'll get the same distributions. I encourage you to try both of these out and go through step by step and make sure you understand what's going on before you fall back on the automated approach. Because it's a real strength that if you program the model yourself, that is if you draw the owl, 
uh, then for any causal query or any kind of prediction at all, even if it's not a causal one, that you want to make from the model, if you understand the model and you can write simulations that correspond to its structure, you can do anything, uh, right? You don't need a captive statistician helping you. Okay, let me try to summarize this, uh, and then we'll take our intermission soon. Um, inference with linear models uh, means uh, beyond the simplest kinds of linear models means thinking harder about the correspondence between the, the causal model and uh, the statistical model that you're going to use. And there are two approaches and they're equivalent and um, in some contexts uh, uh, each is better than the other. So the first approach is uh, step one as always is you state each scientific estimate. Um, then you design a unique statistical model for each of those estimates. And then uh, third step is you compute each estimate from the posterior distribution. And that usually means computing some contrast effect. So in this approach, you, there's one statistical model for each estimate. The alternative, um, uh, which I call a full luxury Bayes, is uh, you state each estimate still, and then you compute the joint posterior for the whole causal system. That is the, the DAG, plus functions that relate the variable to one another implies a full causal graph that you can put into, um, you can compute the joint posterior for given the data. And then from that joint posterior, you can simulate each estimate as an intervention. So now the motto is one simulation for each estimate. Okay, uh, so let me summarize categorical variables and then, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so. Categorical variables are this thing that lets you answer, uh, it's a device, a kind of uh, piece of a golem that lets you answer more uh, structurally interesting uh, scientific questions. And uh, I recommend in this course that we use index coding to do it, and we will in, uh, I think all of the examples uh, use index coding um, because it has a lot of conveniences. Um, and uh, when you use categorical variables this way, just keep in mind that you're computing the contrasts, it's not the individual elements uh, of the of the parameter vector that matter, it's their differences quite often, and you may be interested in some differences and not others. But once you have the posterior distribution, you can compute any of the contrasts you like at any time. Um, I should say we we've done a lot of simulation in this section, and it, it comes at you fast, I know, and it gets confusing. Uh, something to keep in mind is you'll notice in all the examples when I've summarized I've taken a mean or an interval I've always done that as a last step and the reason is because the summaries themselves are just for communication they're not computationally meaningful um, you what you want to compute is is uh, a mean difference uh, between uh, uh, two parameters what you don't want is the difference of the means of the parameters I'll say that again what you want is a a mean difference in two parameters. As the parameters have a distribution, their difference has a distribution, and if you were going to report that distribution to someone, you might report its mean. That's a good focal point. So a mean difference in two parameters. It's a mean contrast effect. Uh, what you don't want to do is compute the means of the parameters first and then take their difference, because that'll give you the wrong answer quite often. So always, this is easy to remember if you just remember, always summarize last. Any summary should be the last step in reporting and never, never up the chain in your calculations. Okay, with that, I think you've all uh, earned a break. So take a short break, stretch, uh, come back tomorrow, whenever you're ready, I'll still be here. Okay, welcome back. I'm gonna finish up this lecture by introducing you to some ways to flexibly use linear models to uh, capture nonlinear relationships. And this is all in pursuit of better scientific models in the sense that, of course, um, real phenomena in nature are not linear forever. They may be linear at local scales, but uh, nonlinear effects are routine. So for example, if we uh, stick with the HAL data set uh, that we've used in, in this lecture and the previous, uh, but now we don't restrict it to adults. You see that the relationship between height and weight is definitely not linear, at least not on the natural scale. <clears throat> uh, but we're still interested in this relationship, and if you're a human biologist, you're very interested in this relationship and understanding how it works and what causes disruptions and, and so on. Um, the good news is linear models can fit this nonlinear shape. Uh, quite readily. Uh, the bad news is that when we do this, it's geocentric. It's not mechanistic, which is to say we're, we're constructing 
uh, non-mechanistic approximations, if we use them with wisdom, that's fine. Uh, but we have to be aware that uh, curve fitting comes with risks and we should um, consider our different choices when we do that. So I want to give you just a quick introduction to some different ways that linear models can uh, create nonlinear functions. <clears throat> the two most popular strategies are polynomials. Uh, and I'm going to try to warn you off these, but by no sense do I, I think that they're useless. Uh, again, if you use them with wisdom, they're fine. It's just that often people use them without wisdom. Uh, and then splines, which um, nearly always in any case in which you use a polynomial, a spline is better. Uh, uh, nearly always, not always. There are always exceptions. And I want to give you a quick introduction to that because there's a very big, uh, large, uh, applied world of splines and, and related methods called generalized additive models. So what's a polynomial linear model? In a polynomial uh, linear model, you merely extend the equation for the mean with higher order polynomial terms. Uh, what does that mean? Well, here's an example on this slide. I have the equation for mu at the bottom of the slide in an ordinary linear regression. There's alpha, which is the familiar intercept, and then we have a term with beta 1 xi. This is just the familiar slope and the predictor. And then here's the new thing. We have a, a new parameter, beta sub 2, which is just a, a new parameter in the model uh, that is multiplied by the square of the x-axis variable. And you can keep adding higher order terms. You can add a term for the cube of x and x to the fourth and x to the fifth and so on. And the more terms you add, the more flexible the function is that you can approximate. Uh, the problem with uh, this can be very effective and you can model nonlinear, essentially any any arbitrary nonlinear uh, continuous path with this. Uh, it's like an epicycle, right? This is like this is a really geocentric type of model. Uh, and because it's geocentric, it carries with it some problems. Uh, it, it often, uh, polynomial models contain symmetries that are often undesirable, that are, that are not supported by the scientific background. And at the edges, the uncertainty at the edges of the data can really be, well, as I say on this slide, explosive, which means that uh, in practice, you can't extrapolate beyond uh, the sample. Uh, outside the range of the sample with uh, with these kinds of curves. <clears throat> so let's let's take a look at the, the traditional animation that I used to introduce these things to you. And this is like the animation in the previous lecture where I introduced linear regression and Bayesian updating with linear regression. We're going to do it now with polynomials. So on the left here, I'm showing the posterior distribution, but it's for B1 and B2, which are the, the two slopes, if you will. B1 is the traditional slope. It multiplies the x-axis variable. And B2 is our, our the slope of the squared term, if you will. It's the coefficient on the squared term. And I start these off with um, Gaussian prior, 0, 1 priors means of zero and standard deviations of one. And uh, on the right, we've got some samples from this, these priors and what's in the posterior distribution or in the prior distribution for the moment in the prior distribution is a bunch of parabolas and some are bendier than others. And so I'm going to start animating that uh, so you can see what the prior implies uh, in this case. And then we introduce one data point and the posterior distribution gets updated and then two and you can see that uh, what the posterior distribution is learning is a range of parabolas that are compatible uh, with the data. And uh, the gray region shows the sort of high density um, range of the, of the parabolas. But you can see that they swing around quite a lot. And in regions with low data, there's tremendous uncertainty about the position uh, of these things. I'll let that play through again so you can see the consequence of this is that it already believes in n equals 1 or n equals 2. It believes in the curvature uh, because it has to curve. It's a parabola and well, it doesn't have to curve, but it really wants to curve. And the slightest evidence is going to curve. And that's a consequence of choosing um, this uh, squared term type of model. So we can fit this uh, to the uh, height and weight data quite uh, easily. And uh, the code for this is in, in the book. I'm not going to emphasize it here. And um, it, it fits OK, but I've extended the range on the horizontal axis to show you that it, is, it extrapolates beyond the range of the sample in quite ridiculous fashion. So the, the forced curvature of the parabola means that on the left, as we go below um, uh, the shortest individuals in the sample, <clears throat> around 50 centimeters, uh, 
uh, it, it actually the model actually thinks that they uh, people get tall, uh, get heavier as they get shorter uh, beyond that and obviously that's ridiculous again you have to exercise some wisdom here about what's going on um, let me show you uh, how extreme you can get with these things you can you can improve the fit arbitrarily by uh, adding higher order terms so on the right here I've this is a fourth order polynomial it contains terms for the the squared the cubed and the h to the fourth and uh, this this fits uh, better than uh, the quadratic one but again at the at the limits of the sample it, it does catastrophically silly things uh, so off the right end it uh, individuals get uh, disastrously lighter as they get taller and um, on the left uh, the individuals shrink into negative weights quite rapidly as they get as they get shorter um, <clears throat> So just a, a bookmark for something we're going to do much later in the course. We're going to come back to this exact problem very near in the last week of the course, and we're going to consider a more biologically uh, inspired or geometrically inspired model of this. But just to uh, show you this now, and you can play around with this in, in your free time if you like, um, if you fit an ordinary linear regression to the full sample, not just the adults, but the full sample, and just take the logarithm of body weight first. So it's a regression of the logarithm of body weight on height. Uh, you get the fit you see on the right, which is a lot better. And uh, we're going to return to this, as I said, in the, in the last week, uh, to, to explain why taking the logarithm results in such a good fit here. And there's a very fundamental biological reason for that uh, that's related to the, the strange uh, um, Vitruvian uh, man or Vitruvian can figure uh, in the graph there. But that's, this is just a bookmark. I'll explain the whole thing uh, near the end of the course. OK, let's uh, talk briefly about splines. I just want to introduce them. There's a long section at the end of chapter 4 that mechanistically walks you through the construction of these. And I just want to give you some uh, conceptual uh, help with that. Um, so splines uh, is a big family of, of functions for, for uh, uh, doing local smoothing, uh, constructing functions that are locally smooth. And, and what does that mean? Um, it means that the points in each region are the ones that determine the shape of the function in that region. And that's very different than polynomials. So I'll say this again. Uh, local functions mean that only the points within each region determine the shape of the function in that region or, or strongly influence it. In polynomials, that's not true. In a polynomial, the whole sample influences each parameter. and There's a small number of parameters determining the global shape of the curve. With splines, that's not the case. There will be parameters which are localized to different positions on the x-axis, and those parameters are informed by the data near those, uh, near those locations on the x-axis. And this makes them um, um, much more customizable. You can uh, estimate lots of interesting functions here, and they, uh, these things behave much better. They carry with it the same um, warnings about uh, uh, being having no mechanistic reality to it. And so uh, these functions will also produce uh, really absurd biological uh, or physical predictions if you let them. So what's a spline, actually? We're going to focus on, on something called basis splines. And uh, a spline actually comes uh, from the real world. It's a, it's a term used in drafting um, architecture uh, for a device that lets you draw a smooth, precise curves on designs. And so what we're looking at here is a spline. That's the uh, thin piece of wood that's bent and has these weights attached to it, those, uh, those uh, brass colored weights are um, uh, heavy enough to hold the spline, which is that curving piece of wood at the top there, in uh, any arbitrary position as long as it's not bent so much that it snaps. And this lets you uh, draw exact curves repeatedly on designs uh, and get them right. Um, statistically, uh, splines use similar ideas, and I'll, I'll walk that out for you in the next slides, but just cartoonishly, it's a good idea to get an idea, that, like, in the prior, before you, it sees any data, what is a spline? And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, thinking of the model, which is the, the spline on the cover of the book, the Japanese cherry blossom uh, graph on the cover of my book. Uh, if we just sample from the prior distribution of the splines, uh, this is what you get. Uh, there are just curves everywhere, and you'll see that there's no real assumed shape to them. They can zigzag up and down all over and be high or be low. Um, uh, splines are incredibly flexible, unlike polynomial models. And uh, then when we train them with data, you see this on the bottom. Again, this is the, the 
graph from the cover of the book, the Japanese cherry blossom data, and uh, the spline here shows the trend. And the wiggling are is uh, independent samples from the posterior distribution at the bottom and the prior distribution at the top. Okay, <clears throat> so what's actually going on in these in these weird splines? So we're we're going to focus on a particular kind of spline, one of the simplest, so-called B splines. Uh, B stands for basis. I'll explain what that means. Uh, these are linear models. They really are literally linear regressions, but uh, they're regressions on synthetic variables. I'll say that again. B splines are literally linear regressions, but they're regressions on synthetic variables. And so you replace the equation for mu with something like what's on this slide. Uh, you still have a traditional intercept alpha there, and then a series, uh, uh, as long as you want it to be. Um, of terms which are weight parameters, those little w parameters, times some capital B variable which is entered as data, but this is data that you build and these are the basis functions. Um, and uh, so the weights are like slopes, they, they determine the importance of the different variables uh, for, for the predicted mean. Uh, for each case i. But the basis functions are synthetic variables that only have um, positive value in particular regions of the x-axis. I'll say that again. The basis functions are synthetic variables that, that you make or your computer makes that are, only have positive values uh, in particular narrow regions, local regions of the x-axis. And so what this means is the, the b variables, the basis functions is what they're called, turn on weights in isolated parts of the x-axis and this this is what uh, allows the the spline to take particular shapes in each region of the curve independent of whatever the shape of the curve is in different parts of the graph as i said there's a it's a very detailed example of building all this up and the code to do it starting on page 114 in the in the book so you be sure to check that for the details of this and you can actually run these models and play with them um, but let me do a little cartoon version to try and try and augment that. What I'm showing you here is a very simple example of a basis spline and uh, uh, we have the basis functions drawn in color. Uh, the red is the first basis function, the green is the second basis function, the blue is the third, and the cyan is the fourth. So there are only four basis functions in this particular spline, but you can have as many as you want. Uh, the, the important thing to understand is what they're doing. They're segmenting the x-axis. So going from left to right here, what you want to see is that on the far left, um, the most important basis function is the red, is basis one. That's the one that's determining the, the shape of the black curve, which is the spline in this case, in the, in the, on the far left of the graph. And then as we move to the right, the green curve uh, takes over gradually. There's a transition so that the green curve is determining the shape of the spline. And then the blue curve, as we move further to the right, determines the shape of the spline. And then the cyan curve on the far right. And so the, each basis function isolates, is only important in a particular region. Uh, of the x-axis and the weight parameters are multiplying each of these and what are the weight parameters in these case uh, in this example the the weight vector a little w vector there's a weight for each basis function have the values 1 minus 1 1 and minus 1 so the way you can think about this is uh, the basis variable values for the red curve, the red basis function, are all multiplied by 1, and so they stay positive. They, they're positive values to begin with, and they stay positive. For the green, it's the opposite. Uh, they're all multiplied by minus 1, and this flips them below 0, so it drags the curve down in that part of the x-axis. And then basis 3, again multiplied by 1, so it pulls the spline back up. And then for basis 4, we multiply by minus 1 again, and that pulls the spline down on the far right. So we can change the weights on each of these and move independently move each part of the spline. So let's start just with basis 1 and uh, switch it so that it has a value of minus 1. And now you can see it's flipped to the, to the bottom of the y-axis and it's pulled the spline down. Uh, and the rest of it has inter interpolated um, uh, smoothly. Uh, we can move the green up. So it now has a value of 1, and now uh, the spline looks like a dome. Uh, we can move the blue down, so it has a, a weight of minus 1, and now it drags that part of the spline down below uh, 0. And then finally, we can move the last, the fourth basis function up and give it a weight of 1, and we've essentially 
mirror image the original spline we started with. Now, of course, the, the weights can take on any value. They don't have to be 1 or minus 1. They can be anything in between or even big numbers. It's just a multiplier that determines how far up or down uh, the spline is in that region of the x-axis. So you can build really complicated uh, functions this way if you have enough basis functions. Let me just give you uh, an example real quick here. Uh, using the Howell data, uh, the last variable in the Howell data set that we haven't looked at, which is age. So we're plotting age in years against height in centimeters for the Kalahari uh, uh, population sample. And you can see that this is a highly nonlinear relationship. A human growth over time is uh, linear in tiny regions, but it's definitely not linear over the lifespan. Uh, but we're going to fit a spline, which is biologically very silly thing to do. Um, uh, but for two reasons. First, I want to give you an idea of what it looks like to fit a spline and how the spline learns from the data. And second, I want to emphasize that when you have some scientific knowledge, you can often do a whole lot better than to do some arbitrary curve fitting. So uh, I have an animation here. We're going to fold in the data set, little pieces at a time. We're going to start with 10 individuals here. And uh, we've, we've trained a Bayesian spline uh, on these 10 individuals and it's going to start animating and then we're going to fold in more data and you can see how the spline learns. So when we start out, look, this, the spline flops around wildly at the ends because there's no data out there. Uh, but as the data slowly fills in, the spline learns where the expected value is for each age because that's what it's trying to do. For each narrow range of ages on the x-axis, it's trying to learn the shape of the, of the function in that narrow range. And each part of the spline can fit independently of the other parts of the spline because the basis functions are narrow in this case. So let this uh, finish up the whole sample so you can get an idea. Notice some of the silly things it's doing. Uh, it's perfectly happy to accept that uh, individuals can get radically uh, uh, shorter or taller at any age because it doesn't know anything about the biology here. The spline doesn't know what height is and it doesn't know what age is. It's just curve fitting. Okay, let's repeat the whole thing, but now with basis functions. So uh, this is the same analysis, but now I'm displaying on the animation the individual basis functions you can see here in black. And there's a bunch of these now, but notice that each of them just isolates a particular part of the x-axis, some narrow age of ranges. And as you move from the left to the right in age, you slide from the domain of one basis function to the next. And then the weights are the parameters that are being learned through Bayesian updating uh, determine how, oh, <coughs> excuse me, how high or low each basis function is relative to the intercept, uh, the black line in the middle there. So I'll start the animation and you can watch the basis functions jump around. It's the same analysis, the same posterior distributions at each step, but with the sampling from the posterior distribution, so you can see that it's the basis functions, the fluctuations in the basis functions that determine the fluctuations in the spline. So at each um, x-axis value, you're merely adding up all of the basis functions. You're merely summing vertically all the black curves to get the value of the blue curve. And that's how basis splines work. Basis splines are great. You can do lots of cool stuff with them in cases where you need to fit some arbitrary function, uh, but you need to uh, keep in mind that uh, biologically or physically they could they could learn some nonsense too. So like all statistical methods, all golems, uh, use them uh, with wisdom because they have no wisdom themselves. Okay, let me try to, to summarize this up, and I have a few more things to say before the end of the lecture. Um, Curves and spines are great uh, because the world is not only linear, uh, and so often to uh, correctly learn some scientific uh, estimate or causal estimate, we've got to successfully model the nonlinear association uh, between different variables as well. It's not enough merely to assume everything's linear. Um, polynomials and splines are both geocentric. Uh, splines are a lot better, typically. Um, so uh, use them with caution, but by all means use them if you need to. And uh, uh, scientific information usually helps us if you can, you can learn over time to insert that into the model as well. So just a couple examples, um, weight only increases with height on average. And uh, so if you can, you can tell the golem that, that'll, that'll help it learn faster from the data. Uh, and height only increases with age on average and then levels off uh, in the early 20s uh, with humans. Okay. Uh, let me exit this by talking about this <coughs> relationship in that light again. If, if we have some scientific information, we can come up with a better strategy. And 
ideally the, the statistical model will be deeply and uh, very much inspired by some generative scientific model of the system. So we're not going to build a, a, a full solution for the age versus height example here, but I just want you to think about, like, you know a lot about human biology because you're human. And uh, for example, um, humans have uh, three distinct growth phases, and each of them has a different rate. So there's infancy, uh, where we we uh, grow quite rapidly, and then there's childhood, where growth slows quite a lot. And indeed, for the first uh, few years of, of childhood, post-infancy, uh, humans grow very little. And then, uh, although the brain continues to grow quite rapidly in that period, and then puberty, around the time the brain stops growing, or, or its growth is essentially stopped, it will grow a little bit more, uh, but it's almost adult size, puberty kicks in, and then there's another growth spurt. And this is uh, earlier, uh, as everybody knows, it's, it's earlier for girls than it is for boys. Uh, and uh, so there's this brief period where, where girls are on average taller than boys. And then around 20, <clears throat> uh, in the early 20s, uh, uh, humans uh, stop growing and then there's typically actually a, a slight decline in stature uh, with age as, as uh, the sands of time uh, weigh down on us. Um, this is biological information and you can build models out of this and in the literature in which people study human growth that's what they do. They don't use off-the-shelf linear models or polynomials or splines, they have more mechanistic models of human growth which recognize these different stages of growth and try to learn the rates of, of growth in each. Okay, uh, we are finishing up the second week now, that was the fourth lecture, and so we're going to continue on next week by talking <clears throat> even more about causation and the links between scientific models and uh, and statistical models and we're going to focus on confounds much more now that is cases where there are things about the data generating process that lead us astray so i'll see you there <laughs>